Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know my time is limited, so I will proceed as expeditiously as possible. I'll begin by saying it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be in the presence of such camaraderie, such love, and such affection. The heat may be very hot outside, but it certainly doesn't match the fire in our hearts and the passion that we have for justice. And I say that so that those who watch what we are doing today in the media can go back and look at the opponents' rallies and gatherings and see if they can match the diversity that is here today. And I say, I say simply to you, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's a racist. Now, I want to, in my time, simply answer one question that people have posed to me, particularly from outside the United States, and that is, so what's really going on in Arizona? So as someone who grew up in Arizona, and as a historian, I'm going to use that lens to answer that particular question. Now, the United States owes much of its economic resilience to replenishing waves of immigrants. Indeed, the descendants of Italians, Jews, Irish, and Germans have, in fact, assimilated. Manhattan's Little Italy is vestigial. It's no more than a conglomeration of restaurants. No disrespect to Brook Brick City. <laughs> now nearly 40% of New York's nearly 9 million residents are foreign born, almost the same percentage as a century ago. This diversity in part has made New York a superpower. Now advocates of stricter immigration enforcement in Arizona argue that those who came a century ago were different because they arrived here legally. That's what they tell us. Movies and novels depict customs agents at New York's Ellis Island. The keyhole through which 16 million immigrants passed between 1882 and 1922, examining immigrants and their papers, quote unquote, with a capricious eye towards shipping back those laggards and those so-called bombs. Peggy Noonan. A former speechwriter for President Ronald Reagan wrote about her Irish forebears in the Wall Street Journal, stating that, quote, they waited in line. They passed the tests. They had to get permission to come. They had to get through Ellis Island, get questioned and eyeballed by a bureaucrat with a badge. Now, I'm a historian, and historians will argue that that analysis is flawed, and it's ahistorical. There were no immigration restrictions in America until the end of chattel slavery and the unprecedented rise in the number of people of color coming into this country. There's a direct correlation between the two. Until 1918, the United States did not require passports. The term illegal immigrant had no meaning. New arrivals were required only to prove their identity and find a relative or a friend who could vouch for them. So these people who were denouncing so-called illegal immigrants now are often the progeny of people who needed only a homie to vouch for them when they got here. Ninety-eight percent, ninety-eight percent of the immigrants who arrived at Ellis Island were admitted to the United States and seventy-eight percent less than eight hours on the island. At the peak of the earlier wave, seventy-five percent of immigrants landed in New York some, like Germans, fleeing failed revolutions, sought democracy in America. Others, like Jews, fleeing persecution and murder. When Congress enacted immigration quotas in the 1920s, it left the door ajar for northern Europeans. But by contrast, in 1882, Congress enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act, barring Chinese from the United States, for the, for the most part because they were economic competition. Still, European immigrants found plenty of backlash themselves. And they have very short memories, the descendants of these European Americans who got that backlash. Nativist sentiments ran strong, and white Protestant reformers championed English instruction only. Sound familiar? <laughs> Mark Twain, even though he was a, a Confederate, said that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. I can certainly hear the rhyme in Arizona and in America. Politicians cast a wary eye at the 300,000 persons living in Little Germany and Lower Manhattan, and there's no trace of it today, and call on Germans to stop being, and I love this quote, 
hyphenated Americans. And I crack up when I see German Americans now telling me that you shouldn't say that you're a hyphenated American, when in fact you were accused of doing the same thing, not 30, 40, 50, or 60 years ago. Also, Italians and Poles and Jews and Slavs poured into New York City. So-called native-born Americans complained about the mongrelization of the white race. And that leads me to my conclusion and what this is really about, what is driving this. Demographic changes and fear. Because there are people in our society who have finally realized that the bell has tolled and that the inevitable has happened and will continue to happen. And that is that their demographic domination of the United States is not going to continue. And they don't know what to do about the loss of the consolidation of their power and their money along epidermal alliances. So the modern, the modern issue began the modern issue in recent times began with the roundups and preemptive war, Guantanamo Bay, indefinite, indefinite detentions, and the ripping apart of families in this country that claims to value families so much. Now here in the United States, armed white right-wing militias run around cutting open gallons of water that volunteers leave in the desert to save immigrants from dying of dehydration. What kind of nation are we that sanctions that type of behavior? while another white ring uh, group in Utah sent addresses and phone numbers of those who are of Latino descent, including pregnant women, to law enforcement agencies demanding that they be deported. Again, what type of nation sanctions that type of behavior? Reactionary Tea Partiers have tweeted that they will, and I quote, kick the ass of illegal advocates. First of all, I don't know any illegal advocates. What I do know are advocates of justice, ad advocates of freedom and humanity. Those are the people that I know. And finally, finally, let me share with you the thoughts of writer Emma Kaplan, who writes in the face of all of this, our president, who I voted for and will vote for again, called upon, you may not want to clap just yet. Uh, and I'll go for it again, but he called upon people to, quote, get past the two poles of debate and refer to SB 1070 as understandable and misguided. I love you, Mr. President. But with all due respect, how can you get past a poll of debate that compares Latinos to a rat infestation? Furthermore, there is nothing understandable about a law that will mean misery, detentions, deportations, and possibly death to innocent people, particularly children and students. The philosophy of common ground and coalition with an unwavering nativist and fascist force paved the way to the gas chambers in Europe. This racist atmosphere, this racist atmosphere will not be lifted by Latinos pledging their allegiance to America any more than when certain Jews attempted to pledge their allegiance to Nazi Germany. We need to stand up and fight. Platitudes are not enough. So, SB 1070 was drafted by an Arizona legislator who had previously appeared in photos hugging a neo-Nazi. Now, I have tenure. But that's some job security when you can hug a neo-Nazi and still have a job. And it was drafted with an influence from an attorney and law professor who was a member of FAIR, an anti-immigrant group founded by a eugenicist and racist, John Tanton, who is concerned with maintaining, and I quote, a European-American majority. That is what this is all about. So what is this really about again? Nothing less than the face of the future of America and the fear of the loss of power and control by members of the dominant society under the guise of legitimate causes such as securing our borders and upholding the law. Thank you very much.